Hello data pros, welcome back to another exciting episode of our Snowflake learning series. In our previous video, we covered the key concepts around Snowflake's storage layer and explained how these concepts are essential to understand advanced features such as micropartitions, time travel, failsafe, and partition pruning. Today, we're taking the next step forward to explore the important concepts related to Snowflake's processing layer. As we're already aware, Snowflake's unique architecture intelligently separates its storage and compute layers, allowing for independent scaling and elastic computing. These layers are typically located close to each other and connected with a high bandwidth network. The compute layer of Snowflake primarily consists of one or more virtual warehouses. You can imagine each virtual warehouse as a shared nothing MPP compute cluster. For instance, the virtual warehouse one here is essentially a cluster of two nodes. It's worth noting that these nodes are provisioned by the underlying cloud service provider. For instance, if you've set up your Snowflake account on AWS, then these nodes are most likely be EC2 instances behind the scenes. Additionally, for enterprise edition or above users, Snowflake offers a multi-cluster warehouse, which is basically a cluster of clusters. A virtual warehouse provides the required resources, such as CPU, memory, and temporary storage or cache, to perform the compute operations in Snowflake. The term virtual warehouse, often referred to simply as warehouse, should not be confused with the more generalized term data warehouse. A typical data warehouse is a complete platform by itself that stores and manages data with its in-house resources. On the other hand, a virtual warehouse in Snowflake is primarily a compute-centric resource. It provides the processing power to query and manage the data stored within Snowflake's storage layer. For instance, virtual warehouse is essential for executing select statements, performing DML operations such as delete, insert, and update, as well as for loading and unloading data in and out of Snowflake tables. Users with required privileges can create virtual warehouses by specifying their size, along with other properties. Snowflake uses a t-shirt sizing system for warehouses, ranging from X small to 6X large. While Snowflake doesn't explicitly mention the exact number of nodes and resources allocated for each size, it's apparent that as the warehouse size increases, the computing power roughly doubles. Naturally, this also results in increased credit consumption and cost. It's important to note that a single query or task is always executed within one virtual warehouse. This means queries are not split across virtual warehouses. Even within a multi-cluster warehouse, a single query runs within a single cluster. Having said that, if your warehouse struggles to handle larger and more complex queries, it's advisable to consider increasing the warehouse size. However, it's essential to note that warehouse resizing is not designed to address concurrency issues, such as accommodating an increased number of concurrent queries and tasks. In such cases, it's recommended to utilize additional warehouses to distribute the workload efficiently, or explore the option of a multi-cluster warehouse. Snowflake leverages a robust caching mechanism to deliver exceptional query performance. During query execution, the virtual warehouse retrieves relevant data or micropartitions from the storage layer. This data is then temporarily cached locally within the virtual warehouse for faster processing. After the required processing in the virtual warehouse, the results are returned to the user. Crucially, this cached data persists within the virtual warehouse until it's shut down. This means subsequent queries requiring the same data can retrieve it directly from the local cache, eliminating the need to access the storage layer again. This significantly speeds up response times for such queries. Although Snowflake does not explicitly state it, it's evident that the local cache is a high-performance storage medium, likely SSD-based. When deciding whether to suspend a warehouse or keep it running, please remember that suspending the warehouse saves cost. However, it's important to note that this action sacrifices the local cache, which could potentially impact performance for future queries. So striking a balance between cost and performance is crucial here. In addition to the local warehouse cache for underlying data, Snowflake also caches the final result set of the query in the cloud services layer before routing the query results to the user. When the same query or a subset of it is run by the same user or another authorized user, the results are delivered directly from this result set cache. 
This cache usually stays for 24 hours from the last access, or until the underlying data in the storage layer changes. Snowflake's caching strategy extends further with a metadata cache stored in the cloud services layer. This cache can directly answer specific queries without spinning a virtual warehouse. A good example is finding the maximum value of a particular column, which can be retrieved directly from the metadata cache. This comprehensive caching system at various levels is a key factor contributing to Snowflake's superior performance compared to other similar data platforms. Even though data is cached at various levels, Snowflake treats the data in its storage layer as the single source of truth. When the source data is modified, Snowflake automatically invalidates the corresponding caches and updates metadata accordingly. Multiple virtual warehouses and or users can simultaneously read, write, and modify the data stored in the storage layer. Snowflake ensures the integrity of data involved in these transactions by adhering to ACID transaction policies. This is achieved through the transaction manager process and the cloud services layer, which coordinates concurrent data access and modification operations seamlessly without conflicts. The size of the warehouse and its management settings are two of the most critical factors to consider when creating a warehouse. If you ignore auto-suspend and auto-resume warehouse management settings, you will have to manually start and stop the warehouse as and when required. Additionally, when setting up multi-cluster warehouses, the number of clusters in a warehouse is also an important setting. It's generally wise to set the minimum cluster count to 1, this ensures that the additional clusters are started only when really needed. Also set the maximum cluster count based on a rough estimate, which you can fine-tune later using alter commands. The power of multi-cluster warehouses lies in their ability to dynamically scale compute power in response to the queries or tasks getting queued within a specific virtual warehouse. However, it's important to remember that with great power comes greater responsibility for cost management. The number of active clusters directly affects credit consumption. For instance, a large multi-cluster warehouse with only one active cluster consumes 8 credits per hour. But if you ramp it up to 10 active clusters, credit consumption drastically increases to 80 for the same one hour duration. That's all for today. Please stay tuned for our next video where we'll explore more advanced Snowflake features. If you found this video helpful, please remember to like and subscribe to our channel. We also welcome your questions or thoughts in the comments section below. Thank you for watching.